In our last nugget, we took a look at DHCP high availability using split scopes. And I promised you in the last nugget that I'd continue that discussion here with DHCP failover, which is possibly the best solution for a highly available DHCP infrastructure. Let's go ahead and take a look at DHCP failover. All right, so how do we actually configure DHCP failover? We do this by right-clicking on IPv4 up here and then choosing configure failover. Now, notice that I've actually got two scopes here that I could use. I could choose select all. I don't really want to use all of them. I'll just choose this one. So you can pick them as you like. And then you can uh, you reuse an existing failover relationship if there's any that already exist there. Uh, I'm not going to use anything that already is there. I'm going to uh, create a new one here. So I'm going to choose DHCP02. And then I'll click on next. And from here, we'll continue on. Now you can see here that you can change the relationship name if you want to. I did that just to make it more readable. We also have the mode, which is important to determine. We can do load balancing, which is similar to a split scope, except that in my case, by default here at least, it's 50-50. You can change that to 80-20, 70-30, whatever you want to. It's a little bit arbitrary. The other difference between this and a normal split scope that we looked at earlier is that there's no millisecond delay. Both partners in this relationship are equally capable of issuing IP addresses, all things being equal. So statistically, they both would have probably about 50% of the addresses least. The other thing I could do would be go to hot standby mode. And with that one, we can make our partner server, in other words, DHCP02 in this relationship, a standby only. And that means that it's not going to issue any addresses unless DHCP01 goes offline, and then it will issue 5% of the addresses. But I could also go to active, and if I do active, then it will also issue addresses, but it will only issue 5% by default. If you really want to make it active, you probably need to make that more. So I might make it 30% because, or even 50%. Because otherwise, with only 5% on an active server, it's going to probably deplete those pretty quickly. In my case, I'm just going to go here to uh, load balanced mode. And then I also want to point out a couple of other interesting dialogues here. And it's actually these, these options here. First, first one here is the maximum client lead time, which is an hour by default. But I'm going to change that to five minutes for purposes of an explanation coming up. And then there's also the state switchover interval, which I'll discuss separately here coming up as well. Let's first of all take a look at the maximum client lead time and see the value of that. You can see that I changed mine to five minutes. What happens is if DHCP01 issues 10.10.10.7 to client 01, then what it does is it, it sends that information over here to DHCP02. Because remember, these two DHCP servers actually have their own databases. They just update each other on whatever it is that they're leasing out. They don't have shared storage like you would have in clustering. But the key thing here is when DHCP01 updates and tells DHCP02 that it's leased this address, DHCP02 leases it for eight days, or it shows a lease time of eight days. Now, the advantage of this is what if right after we updated DHCP02, DHCP01 failed? Well, now we see that DHCP02 still maintains that lease duration of eight days for that particular client, and that's probably enough time for us to get DHCP01 back up and running again and kind of resync everything, right? But let me back out of that a little bit here and uh, take a look at another scenario. What if when we attempted to lease that address, DHCP01 still leased this, but it was only for five minutes, but then right after it did it and before it could update DHCP02, uh, DHCP01 failed. Therefore, DHCP02 has no record of this lease that went out. That's the advantage of the maximum client lead time of five minutes. Because now that it's down, for this five minutes at least, it's possible that DHCP02, that when it comes alive, it could issue a lease at 10.10.10.7. Uh, you know, maybe the chances are a little bit slim that it would do that, but it could happen within this five-minute interval. However, what happens with a DHCP lease is it actually starts to, to attempt to renew the lease at 50% of the lease time. So in two and a half minutes, uh, client 01 will attempt to renew 10.10.10.7 against DHCP 01, but it's down so that it won't get anything. Therefore, it's going to send out a general message and DHCP 02 will pick it up. And then DHCP 02 will say, oh, oh wait a minute, you want .7? Okay, that's fine. You can have it. And then it will lease that. 10.7 to client 01 for the conventional eight day lease. So you see, it's really to your advantage that we have a really short lease time right here just to avoid that kind of halfway in between time where a server goes down and didn't 
properly or adequately update the other server over here. Uh, by the way, when that client leased that IP address for five minutes, it only does that on the initial lease. When it tries to renew it, and if it successfully renews it from its original DHCP server, then it gets the normal lease duration, which is by default eight days. Now the scenario I showed you just now was for a load balance scenario like this, where either one of those servers could have equally issued those address. Uh, but let me show you another thing that actually not me many people know about this, but that helps to split this up a little bit to again help ensure that they don't do duplicate addressing. What happens is there's actually a hash <laughs> of the MAC address for the clients that are requesting the address. And so, for example, the, the local server here will will service any addresses that come in at the top half of the range, and the partner server will address uh, will issue any addresses that come in at the lower hash value of those MAC addresses. Okay, I'm not spelling very well anyway, but you get the idea. Uh, so there's a there's a hash value that takes place that helps to make sure that these are two are separated and that they don't overlap one another's IP address spaces. Another thing to keep in mind is that both of these servers here will maintain a persistent connection with one another under normal circumstances over TCP 647. And if there's any reason for this communication to fail, then they go into what's co called a communication interrupted state. Now, depending upon what kind of original configuration they were in, they'll take different actions. So, for example, if they're in a load balanced state, uh, that's fine, you know, and you know, maybe this server went down and that's why the communication is interrupted. DHCP02 will continue to issue addresses the same way that it always has, and because of the hash value issue, it's not likely to issue addresses that have been already been issued by this server over here. So that that helps a little bit. Plus this issue here where it issues the IP address for only five minutes, which we already discussed earlier. All right, let's wrap this up. Notice that there's also an enable message authentication. You can enter in a password here, uh, and that will help to make sure that you don't have a man-in-the-middle attack that gets in the between these two. Then you just finish this and then close, and now we'll see that down here under DHCP02, when I refresh the screen, we'll see that we not only have the scope itself with the pool that we have specified here. Notice this, these should all match. So if I click on one server, it should be exactly duplicated on the other server. Address lease is up here, exactly duplicated down here. Any reservations up here, again, exactly duplicated here. Scope options should all look exactly the same. Also policies and filters, but I removed any of the, any of the ones that I had, I think, so I don't think I'm going to show anything there anyway. But otherwise, you'll see here that they all exactly now duplicate with one another. All right, now I'm going to simulate a failure here. I'm using VMware Workstation 11 here. I'm going to go back over to my removable devices here to the network card on DHCP01 and disconnect it to simulate a network failure here. Now what I'll do is I'll go down to DHCP02. So now then switching over here to DHCP02, uh, then I go to my IP version 4 here, and as I go down to the properties, we'll notice that we have this failover tab, and I can edit the existing relationship here if I want to, and this is all the same stuff we looked at before. But now if I know good and well that DHCP01 is on fire and it's you know <laughs> in a bad, bad state, uh, not just a temporary network interruption, then I can change to partner down, at which point it will change from communication interrupted to partner down. And then I click OK here, and now DHCP02 takes the full onus or the full responsibility for the entire scope. In this nugget, we took a look at DHCP high availability with DHCP failover. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.